Welcome to our two-part symposium. We'll be starting off with an opening prayer to be led by Miss Baron. Let us bow our heads and place ourselves in the presence of the Lord. Dear Lord, we stand before you in humble prayer before we start with this symposium. We, really, we realize that without your blessings, we would not be able to succeed with the plans we have for this activity. Bestow your grace and divine wisdom to all of us present here so we could cooperate and enjoy camaraderie and love for greater glory of your name. May we also retain the invaluable knowledge and learning experiences that we derive from this activity for the actual application. Grant us your divine wisdom as we go about our daily tasks after this symposium. We ask all these through your mighty name. Amen. Mga kababayan, ang pambansang awit ng Pilipinas. Ayang maghiliw, ito sa sinahanan, alam ng puso, sa dikit mo'y buhay. Upang hinihang, huyag ka ng mahiting, sa manlulupin, di ka pasisigil, sa nagatang tutok sa simoy at sa langit mong pangraw, ay hinagang sulakaw, isang pagkaya minamahal. Good morning to everyone. It is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the Symposium of DG Arts 111. The Symposium for today is about protecting endangered plant and animal species. This topic will serve as a reminder and an awareness that there's a lot of endangered plant and animal species today. And the other topic that will be discussed here is about the pros and cons of genetic engineering. This topic will serve as an addition to our knowledge and this may deepen and expand what we may know about genetic engineering since not much has been explored when it comes to this topic. The first session is about the endangered plant species that will be discussed by the keynote speakers, Mr. Augustine and Ms. Alcantara. We hope that by the end of this symposium, you can walk away with a greater appreciation and a much wider perspective when it comes to genetic engineering and the endangered plant and animal species. Good morning, everyone. In today's symposium, we are going to tackle the topic on how to protect different kinds of plants. The first half for this topic is the different endangered plant species and the Endangered Species Act of 1973. Our first two guest speakers will explain different kinds of plant species, as said earlier, and to know more about the law that has been approved that helps us to take care of our environment. The second half for this topic are preserving the natural habitats of endangered plant species and different ways on protecting the endangered plant species. So why are plants important? Plants are the basis of all life forms of this planet, and therefore it is great importance that we protect as many species of plants as possible. Plants are the primary factors that constitute the food cycles and other nature-based cycles in the environment. As plants are proven backbone of our ecosystem, it is a serious threat to our natural habitat when many important species of plants have started becoming endangered from this planet. This is the worst thing that we shall leave behind for our generations to come. Plants also are an important piece of region's biodiversity. They are vital to ecosystems and are essential resources for both wildlife and humans. The Philippines is home to between 10,000 and 14,000 species of plants. 
of these, more than half are endemic to the country, meaning they are found only in the Philippines and nowhere else. The Philippines possesses around 5% of the Earth's plant species and ranks fifth in the world for the overall number of plant species existing within the country. As we can see, guys, the Philippines is somehow a most plant species in our home. Most of them are rare and can only be seen in our country. But as we keep on making our cities modern with the usage of billboards, roads, buildings, and such, our natural environment is starting to decrease, making plant species nowhere to be found in cities. Luckily, rural places are still taking care of our natural environment where they used to live in the nature with only the use of woods and animals for survival. It really makes our country to be one of the rarest plant species that exists in the same country. As stated by Valerie Tan, Director of Plant Research at Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden Center of Conservation and Research of Endangered Wildlife, a conservative estimate is that about 9% of present species fall into this category. If, as some scientists suspect, as many as one-third of the 500,000 plants believed to exist on the Earth are at risk, that means that 15,000 exceptional plants could require the kind of botanical intensive care that per man and plant have provided on a cabbage on sick. Given the germ state of plants around the globe, there's no time to lose. As said by Craig Hilton Taylor, head of International Union for Conservation of Natural Studies of Imperial Species Program, 2,787 plants are considered critically endangered, defined as suffering and extremely high risk of extinction. In many cases, fewer than 50 individuals remain in the world. In addition to the critically endangered species, 4,269 plants on the red list are deemed endangered, with a very high risk of extinction, and another 5,725 are considered vulnerable, facing a high risk of extinction in the world because to date only 8% of known plant species have been accessed for inclusion on the red list. These numbers are certain to end. Thank you to our amazing keynote speakers. Now we may move on to our first subtopic, which is about the different endangered plant species that will be discussed by Mr. Almoguera and Mr. Morris Angeles. Since Mr. Almoguera is not here, I'll be taking... Um, ako po muna yung magkasalita para sa aking part. So, we all know that the human species are the main causes of some of the losses of many endangered species in our planet. I'm not saying that all of us humans, but there are still many people who practices illegal stops like poaching, killing, animal trafficking, and many more. This causes the imbalance in the ecosystems to, ecosystem to rise above because of this because of these illegal practices. Many people are still responsible for, for this illegal activity intentionally, intentionally or unintentionally. Some of us sell different species of animals or plants are involved. Here in my topic, I will be discussing different endangered plant species. We all have, we also have, a, how well spectacular the Lipo, telepody. This plant only has five population remaining. All of them in Oregon's northern east. In 1999, about 30,000 plants remain. But but its population drops annually due to unnecessary grass mowing in the areas this plant calls home. Another one is called ste, Stenogen canehoa. canehoa. This member of the mint family was said to be extinct in 2000 until one sighting of a plant confirmed it was still alive. 
growing only in one main mountains of the islands of Oahu, a stage in Kanahoma has dense fury leaves. In 2001, in the Lion Arboretum, it was discovered that the cutting of this plant can be grown successfully in captivity. Next is Ochita Och Mountain Goldenrod. Thought to be, to, thought to be a remand, remnant of the last ice age, the actual population of this species is unknown. It lives in three countries along the border of Arkansas and Oklahoma. It prefers to live in cool, moist climate like the crest of Ochita Mountains. Another one, and Rubio in 1992. There are about 150 plants of the Solanum dimopilum left. Native to Puerto Rico, this bush has sharp thorns that protect it from being eaten. It is it is close to extinction because of the harm that is done to gra grazing animals that ingest it. Next, Arizona gave with less than 100 plants alive in 1984. A gave Arizona has managed to keep its population from declining cons considerably. Only two population has survived. Both, lo both located in Tonto National Forest of Scalding, Arizona. The New River Mountains and Sierra Arkans Mountains are, are thought to be only habitats of this rare specimen by Center of Plant Conservation. These are not only plant species that we can possibly lose if we continue some harmful activities that will harm them. It can be anything as if it's cause of greenhouse effect, global warming, climate change, climate changes, and many more. That are reasons of this species to be extinct. We should help prevent this kind of loss because they are living in our planet too. And they deserve to live like anybody else. This is also a huge loss to ecosystem if we don't take some actions immediately. If you can help to their extinction, just consider to have a care for the environment, for the environment and the na nature to avoid this kind of extinction happened again. Not only for them, but to other species too. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful insight about the endangered plant species. Now we may move on to the next topic, which is about the Endangered Species Act of 1973 by Mr. Keith Angeles and Mr. Antonio. The Endangered Species Act of 1973 was signed into law by President Richard Nixon on December 28, 1973. The U.S. Supreme Court called it the most comprehensive legislation for the preservation of endangered species enacted by any nation. The purposes of the ESA, or the Endangered Species Act, are twofold. It is to prevent extinction and to recover species to the point where the law's protections are not needed. The act is administered by two federal agencies, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, or the FWS, and the Na National Marine Fishery Services, or the NMFS. The act also serves as the enacting legislation to carry out the provisions outlined in the Convention on International Trade Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, or the CITES, or CITES. Good morning, everyone. It is hereby declared the policy of the state to conserve, improve, and protect its natural resources and environment, and take steps to conserve endangered and threatened wildlife species, both flora and fauna. The trade or export or re-export of fish or wildlife plant or whatever species, dead or alive, belonging to either the, the endangered or threatened species as contained in the appendices of the Convention, as defined in this Act, is prohibited. The presence of any specimen mentioned in Section 3 
here of inside peers or airport and for national international travel or in the possession of one who is going out of the Philippines is considered a prima facie violation of this act. Any person who violates the provisions of the act shall be punished with a fine of not less than 20,000 pesos, but not more than 50,000 pesos or imprisonment of not less than six years, but not more than 10, 10 years or both at the discretion of the court. Order, letter of instruction rules and regulations inconsistent with this act are hereby repealed or modified accordingly. This act shall take effect 15 days after its complete publication in the newspaper or general circula circulation. Thank you for discussing about the Act of 1973. Now we may continue to the next one, which is about preserving the natural habitats of endangered plant species by Ms. Arsinas and Mr. Babiera. So good day, everyone. So preserving the natural habitats has never been so important in the history of humanity and for the sake of humanity. Uh, habitat losses among the greatest threats species diversity in the natural world occurring when natural land cover or its aquatic equivalent is destroyed, fragmented, or degraded, usually because of human activity. A great, uh, a great many of the rare plants that occur on the natural, national forests and grasslands are best conserved by keeping their native habitats healthy. Sometimes the only action necessary is to conserve and protect existing rare plants habitat and to conduct periodic monitoring to ensure that rare plant populations are still thriving. Periodic monitoring of healthy rare plant populations can protect their long-term existence by detecting downward trends or alteration of their habitat, which should otherwise go unnoticed. Some species and population of rare plants, however, need more than habitat conservation. These plants need active, active management to reserve downward population trends. Periodic monitoring is also, also essential to detecting the first signs of decline in rare plant populations and their habitats. Once we determine a particular set of corrective con actions needed to uh, reserve the decline of a rare plant population, we implement those necessary actions. Hiking, mountain climbing, beach hopping, and fishing. These are some activities that a lot seems to enjoy but some forget to take careful measure to ensure that no living things gets damaged. It seems fun and exciting until you know that some plants are becoming endangered each day that pass. Providing a healthy home for them is not as complicated as contributing to the world's life in total. To start on your own little ways and spread the act that can be helpful step in promoting such. We need to protect endangered plants as much as how we protect the plants that we collect at home. When a, when a thing gets endangered, it rules that the point that there is an imbalance in the ecosystem. The loss of kind often triggers the loss of other species and it is something that is very alarming since our global warming gets worse. Let us buy smart. Do not buy products that get successfully made at the expense of living species. Let us avoid harmful pesticides and cultivate a culture of using organic materials. Some may not know, but driving harshly on the road, especially in the province, sometimes lead to the killing of plants along the road. Let us drive carefully. Let us also promote planting and replenish the local ecosystem. Be responsible too when going to the beach, mountains, or anywhere that holds life. Being a responsible citizen does not only mean that you follow the rules in the community, but it is also about contributing in the well-being of our nature, the place we live in. Start living organically. Let us now continue to the different ways on protecting the endangered plant species by Ms. Baron and Ms. Bernades. So um, good day. 
If we let illegal activities keep happening and continue to harm mother nature, it is possible that we face loss of extinct species in the Philippines soon. So now that, so now that we still have a chance, let us protect the endangered, critically endangered, vulnerable, and threatened species in the Philippines. So um, here are some ways that you can do in order to protect the different types of endangered, endangered plant species. First is to learn about the endangered species in your area. Second is to spread awareness. Third is to recycle and buy sustainable products. Fourth is to grow native plants instead of buying. Next is to reduce your personal footprint, drive less and commute if it's possible. Next is to not buy plastic products. Then Next is to pressure the public servants. Eight is to volunteer to protect the wildlife. Nine is to not purchase products from companies that are known polluters. Ten is to do not use herbicides and pesticides. Eleven is to never purchase products made from threatened or endangered species. And lastly is to protect wildlife habitat. According to the organization, National Park Service, in 2019, a certain plant located in the Grand Canyon National Park is known to be the century milk vetched, and thus it is to be an endangered plant but also endemic, meaning that the plant would only be found inside the park itself. In order to preserve and protect this endangered plant, the park restricted visitors to areas where the plants would sprout and flourish in order for the plant to have time to recover. While park biologists are actively cultivating century milk veg plants in a greenhouse for transplant back in areas that have been damaged by people walking off trail. Stated by Richard T. Corlett is that there do not need to be any more plant extinctions. The combination of a well-designed, well-monitored, and well-managed system of protected areas with ex situ conversa conversation in seed banks were necessary. Living collections and cryostorage should be enough to protect all land plant species through the next few decades of rapid global change. The major barrier to this goal of zero global plant extinctions are the many undescribed plant taxa which cannot receive targeted protection, the low percentage of known taxa whose status has been assessed so we cannot uh, efficiently assign protection. The uneven global coverage of protected areas, particularly in the hyper-diverse humid tropics, and the lack of plant inventories within them. We may now proceed to the summarization of the keynote speakers. So the topic has finished. So how cool that aside from the plants that we knew are already in common, there are different rare plant species that still exist in this year today. And somehow, we feel comfort about having law that helps us to protect our nature and our environment. Somehow, we need to take care of it because some of them are already endangered now due to human activities that we cause to environment like deforestation, illegal logging, and such. It causes plant species to reduce their production because of lack of habitat that they need. If you want to make sure that they'll never go extinct, be sure to stop replacing it into buildings. We have other ways on placing it. We should replace the plants into a new one. We should take care of the plants like how plants take care of us. Remember, humans and other living things need oxygen that comes from plants. And remember to follow the law. You should still take care of it and have an integrity. Oh, by the way, Miss Alcantara, do you have anything to add? Protecting habitat. Protecting habitat saves entire communities of plants. Endangered plant species is a population of organisms which are at high risk of becoming extinct 
either due to loss of habitat, high death rate, or changes in environmental and predation parameters. That's why it is important to preserve the natural habitats of plants, because without adequate protection, a preservation or conservation measure, an endangered species finally goes to extinction. That is permanent disappearance from Earth's surface. Unfortunately, many of our species have not fared well over the past few decades. Mm -hmm. Suffering from threats such as habitat loss and the spread of invasive species. It is important to defend and strengthen the Endangered Species Act protecting, restoring and connecting the habitats of which endangered species and other wildlife defend for their survival. Mm -hmm. And encouraging wildlife friendly land management practices reducing threats to wildlife that can lead to their endangerment and extinction, such as loss of habitat, contamination of water, and spread of endangered species. Thank you for discussing the different ways on protecting the endangered plant species and for that wonderful summarization. That will be all for the first session about the endangered plant species. It is truly wonderful to hear all those very informative insights from our keynote and guest speakers. Now let us welcome the second session, which is about the endangered animal species, which will be introduced by our keynote speaker, Ms. Benito. Hi, good morning, everyone. I am Ms. Benito. And we'll be, talk, we'll be talking about the endangered animal species. So uh, millions of animal species are endangered because people kill animals. People do not take time to care for them and people do not understand the meaning of endangered animals. Animals cannot do anything about what happened to them because studies show that animals do not understand what humans do. Since the animals do not understand what is going on, people need to help them out and support how they react to the economy. Throughout history, animals are becoming more endangered as the years go on because of how people treat their economy and how they treat the species around their area. The problem with this society is that people would rather go on with their days than use 10 minutes to help save an animal's life. Animals are slowly dying off, and if we don't do something, we could lose them forever. Extinction is a well-known thing in our world today. Many animals are endangered, meaning they are close to going extinct. Some common endangered animals are polar bears, blue whales, and penguins, to name a few. While some of the animals that are endangered are not of use to us, many are. And just because an animal isn't of use to us, doesn't mean we shouldn't save it, because we are the main reason they are endangered. Lots of animals are endangered and we aren't doing enough to help them stay alive. Because of this, we need to bring awareness to more people about the issue and do more as individuals to help the cause. That is all. Thank you to our keynote speaker for that wonderful insight. We may now proceed to our first subtopic, which is about the different endangered animal species, which will be discussed by Ms. Cacho and Mr. Carina. Good morning, classmates. We're going to talk about the different endangered animal species. According to I, you see red list of Threatened species that global authority and special conservation status. One of the, the four, one out of four of the bird mammals and 40% of amphibians and threatened with extinction due to human activity put nature in unable to handle the strains that human is putting on the globe because habitat is destruction. The effects of Habitat extraction and basically the loss of species and resources. Every type of habitat destruction results in retaliation and and over assumption and unsustainable human population work are bringing about the massive changes in the environment and in the 
attitude by love, by disrupting ecosystem in human response of most in endangered animal species. First comes from two Greek words, rhino and seros. The word, the word rhino is no and the seros is horn. Unfortunately, the poaching for their distinctive horns is their biggest threat. They are using intelligence and display as a status symbol and demonstrate the price that Javan rhino horn can set up to three top three the black market. Because of these three of the five species, in the world, the black rhino, the Japan rhino, and the Sumatran rhino. The Japan rhino is the closest to extinction with the with only between 46 to 66 individual levels, all of which are in Ujong Kolon National Park in Indonesia. While rhinos are endangered animals, habitat loss is their major threat to rhino population. As more and land is needed for agri agriculture, there is less available for rhino to thrive in. Rhinos need a large area in which to feed a room. If rhino population and end up fragmented, with no safe corridors to travel through, changes chances of successful breeding and recovery will further decline. The next one is tiger. That has striped fur aside from the wall. Such color allows them to attack their potential prey. These stripes with countless reasons, mostly man made, are responsible for the continuing decrease in the number of tigers. These reasons include habitat loss. Climate change, illegal poaching, retaliatory killing, countless reasons, mostly man made, are responsible for the continuing decrease in the number of tigers. This is the habitat loss, climate change. As the population of humans in the world continues to rise, the process of industrial development, urbanization, and agriculture growth remain to appear evil as such. And break into one of their natural habitat. Tigers are known to be highly adaptable creatures, yet, global warming brought about climate change is quickly growing faster than the adults are endangered. The, the destruction of their, their habitats and loss of natural resources, the process of poaching, the act of, of illegally killing. And animals is one of the immediate threats to add to tiger as the curse of being rare. Tigers are extremely valuable. The next valuable. The next one is related to the recent mention about loss of habitat. Since tiger are already dispersed for food, tiger is present. And lastly. The panda. panda are, pandas are one of the most easily recognized animals. They're both black and white coloration. Since almost all other bears have just solid coat color, pandas are highly, they are also unique in other ways. For example, the diets of most bears are come of plant materials such as berries and other animals such as speech in insects. Pandas ex exclusively eat bamboos. Unfortunately, these fascinating birds are, hard, are highly endangered due to habitat loss and other issues. Pandas are endangered mainly due to habitat loss. Humans have cleared much of bamboo forests that pandas panda eat only bamboo. They cannot adapt to live outside of those forests the way other animals do, unless the pandas are provided by provided with bamboo. Pandas 
sa habdipi continuous reproducing, even in capti- captivity due to their extremely choosiness about their team, about their mate, their low nutrient list, and the fact that they usually only have one bio cup at a time. Poaching is also an issue for pandas. Since panda skin spells, spells are vulnerable on the black market. By far, the biggest facing wild animals and the biggest and they are critically endangered to adoptions. They cannot simply move into cities when their forests are destroyed, mainly because they are so specifically adapted to a large of eating bamboo. Panda's digestive system and digest anything else because bamboo shoots and leaves don't contain many nutrients and nutrients. Panda also must consume vast quantities around 20 to 40 a day. Even if pandas could eat, could eat something other than bamboo, pandas could, could and never live in safety in cities or towns. Due to their large for pandas, the environment they original they originally adapted to to the only environment where they can it may be thinkable that anyone would knowingly kill an endangered animal but happened via illegally poaching. Panda skins and pelts can fetch poachers hefty sums of money on the black market. China has strict penalties for an poaching pandas, but so just persist at the risk. With, with wild panda, never as low as they are, even a single panda, the poachers are taking loss. Thank you. The Philippine tar shear is one of the smallest primates in the world. With an average weight of a mere 110 grams to 140 grams, they live in the southeastern Philippines within primary and secondary tropical rainforests, mangrove forests, among bush thickets, tall grasses, and bamboo. They are much rarer in agricultural and other developed areas. Tarshiers move around the forest by leaping amongst and clinging to trees. Tarshiers are nocturnal animals, meaning they are awake at night. And they use their very large eyes to navigate and hunt for food at night. They can rotate their head 180 degrees, just like an owl does, and even precise backward leaping through trees and other ve- vegetation. <clears throat> now, the loss of Philippine tarsier habitat is primarily due to logging and mining in the forests that they live in. Along with the presence of an illegal pet trade industry and being hunted for food by local people have threatened the tarsier population. Now another species is the tamarau, or the others call it as a water buffalo. The tamarau or Mindoro dwarf buffalo, Bobulus mindorensis, scientific name, is a small hoof mammal belonging to the family Bovidae. It is endemic to the island of Mindoro in the Philippines and is the only endemic Philippine bovin. It is believed, however, to have once also thrived on the larger island of Luzon. Another critical, critically endangered animal that can soon be among the extinct animals in the Philippines is, of course, the tamarau. The tamarau critically endangered species is endemic to the province of Mindoro. It features shiny black hair, backward facing horns, and a height no taller than a kindergartner, but a famous tempers and will readily wield their horns against intruders, a behavior called tusking. It has been in the critically endangered, critically endangered list since the year 2000. They are threatened mainly due to habitat destruction and hunting for food. Their shrinking habitat forced them to move further inland into the thick forest. More than 10,000 tamarau once lived across the island of Mindoro, but hunting, 
habitat degradation, and disease over the years have sent the population spiraling downward, with only about 500 left today. Now, the next endangered species that is very endemic to the Philippines is, of course, the Philippine eagle. Now, the Philippine eagle, also known as the monkey eater, has a dark face and a creamy brown nape and crown. The back of a Philippine eagle is dark brown. While the underside and underwings are white, the heavy legs are yellow. With large powerful dark claws and prominent large high arced deep beak is a bluish gray. The eagle's eyes are blue gray. Among the rarest and most powerful birds in the world, it has been declared that the Philippine eagle is the Philippine national bird. Oh yeah, by the way, the tamaro is also the national animal of the Philippines. It is critically endangered, mainly due to massive loss of habitat resulting from the deforestation in most of its range. And another cause of its endangerment is because of, you know, hunting, illegal hunting. That's it. Thank you for discussing the different endangered animal species. We may now continue with the National Wildlife Federation, which will be discussed by Mr. Salandro and Mr. Shawan. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, I mean, good morning, everyone. Uh, today, we will talk about the National Wildlife Federation. Uh, the National Wildlife Federation's mission is to inspire Americans to protect wildlife for our children's future. For over 80 years, the National Wildlife Federation has been a leader in conservation and environmental education, shaping the future stewardship for the Earth in the United States. Through their educational programs, publications, and multimedia outreach, the National Wildlife Federation is dedicated to three objectives. Number one, connecting people with the nature. Number two, safeguarding wildlife and wild species. And number three, providing solutions to climate change. In short terms, uh, the National Wildlife Federation wants to make a harmonious environment where humans, and humans plants, and animals can coexist peacefully. Uh, I think it is so much that we should care about the wildlife because the animal, plants, and marine biodiversity keeps the ecosystems functional. Healthy ecosystems allow us to survive, get enough food, and make living. That is why uh, the National Wildlife Federation are founded. And after having known about this, uh, it has been a great desire for me on keeping the wildlife safe and kind of. We as individuals can do the same thing as the National Wildlife Federation do. Uh, in fact, many people have already done the same thing. Uh, I think we should too. Let us start with ourselves and influence others to do the same thing because it is the right thing to do if we want to extend the life of our Mother Earth. That's all for me. We will move on to Mr. Shakon. The National Wildlife Federation protects and restores wildlife populations of both game and non-game species. Their work includes restoring bison to key public and tribal lands in the West, including the Charles M. Russell National Wildlife Refuge. They work with local ranchers and tribal members to make restoration successful in their communities and protect and connect habitat for bison bighorn sheep, grizzly bears, and other species through our Adopt a Wildlife Acre program. The National Wildlife Federation has long been focused on protecting the most, most vulnerable of our wild species. We are committed to defending, strengthening, funding, and ensuring effective implementation of the Endangered Species Act and other wildlife laws the maximum benefit of fish and wildlife populations. We are also committed to protecting our threatened and endangered species from emerging threats, including the growing impacts of climate change. It is amazing what the National Wildlife Federation is doing in conservation, uh, conserv conserving these animals, species earlier than they... <clears throat> turned out to be endangered. Uh, stopping something from, <clears throat> from happening earlier than it is too late for them to guard these animals. Also, 
In doing grassroots program is another way of restoring habitat and wildlife population. It is additionally a way of connecting to the natural world. That's all for me. Thank you. Thank you for the information about the National Wildlife Federation. Let us now move on to the next, which is about preserving the natural habitats of endangered animal species by Ms. Sally and Mr. C.B. The Philippines, composed of more than 7,000 islands, is also home to more than 50,000 different species that reside in our lands and waters, and more than 100 million people all over. From our cities to our mountains, our lands also hold the highest levels of discovery when it comes to mammals in, a few, in the past few years. A reminder that all, we, that all we know may not all we have, yet we seem to miss out on protecting our endemic species, deforestation due to illegal logging, the mismanagement of our lands, corruption by people in power, and the greed of ordinary people who are willing to destroy our home. For money are some of the main reasons our animals suffer, habitat loss, lo losing their homes along with their food, and eventually their lives. It is important to save animals because we are nothing without them. Humans, animals, plants, microbes, and other abiotic and biotic components are parts of ecosystem. And this planet, all are interdependent on each other and extinction of any of them affects everyone. In, other ca in some cases, um, some species are in danger or have gone extinct because of changes we've made, hunting, um, new species, introduction, pollution, etc. In, a, in, those case, in those cases, it's hard to predict the long-term impact of that species' disappearance. It might throw off the whole balance of the ecosystem and ultimately be harmful to us economically or even to our survival. In some other cases, when it happens, mostly, mostly naturally, it's still bad to lose an entire species that will never come back because who knows all the knowledge that we could learn from it and we'd be losing forever. Now comes wild animals. They eat, they eat each other and maintain balance. Think if tigers extinct, then no grass will be left after a time. And this will also create a big problem. You can never foresee the consequence of each extinction and variation is the key of keep community to keep a community stabilized and able to resilient after disturbance. That is why biodiversity is so important, and that's why endangered species worth our effort to protect. Now, CV, this is your floor. Now, floor is yours again. <laughs> Hi everyone. I like you present about the foreign foreign topic. Based in, based in on the archive or the article by National Geographic, conservation of wildlife is a better practice for protecting their habitats, ecosystems, plants and animal species and biology. It is important for our world and the uh, environment for our God's creation and modern nature, modern nature needs to protect nature. So the plants and animals species are no longer to extinct. The population of humans has been growing exponentially over the past 200 years ago, and now the population is over 7 billion, growing faster than natural resources are consumed by overpopulation. The organizations are helping to research biodiversity and help you to guide our world and the environment. Here's a reason why. We came here to rescue the animals from the climate change and uh, and also the natural disasters. Like for example, the polar bear was stranded by the ocean, and because about the ice meltdown, about the sun 
raise the light and the iceberg begun to melt, followed by the mountains, even their penguins too. But soon neither the wildfires are burned. Burn the, burn the forest, the wild savanna, and of course the, pro the rainforest, followed by earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, the typhoons, they destroyed their habitats. But the fishermen are, are using the dynamite to explode, explode the corals and they destroyed their home, even their fishes are died. The oil spills around the ocean, same too. Fishes are dead. But the sharks, they're, ha they're making a uh, fin soup, but now the sharks are become in danger. To reason why, we must protect our world. Our time has come to guide us, pray for God to save God's creation and modern nature. Use the recycle so never be spilled, even never using dynamites. The, the organization of wildlife needs to rescue the, all wild animals, even the endangered species, so never to be extinct. And that's why my explanation about preserving the natural habitat, habitats of the endangered species of an animals. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful insight about preserving the natural habitats of endangered animal species. Now let us continue with the International Rhino Fund, which will be discussed by Ms. Ugali and Mr. Vaz. Hello and good morning. So, after the current poultry crisis, lifting the ban on international rhino horn trade was proposed as means to fight illegal trade. The proposal was based on the legal supply of rhino horn that, ca that can be economically impossible. The uncertainties surrounding the current market conditions in the rhino horn market made a strict policy evaluation unviable. But they were able to assess the premise in terms of requisite and sufficient conditions under which market processes can be expected to deliver the mentioned results. In this case, these conditions include a range of expectations about the agent's behavior and market configurations. The underlying economic theorem is that the relationships connecting causes to effects in the workings of market processes. It is also a key component of this assessment exercise. The hypothesis that the trade legalization mentioned can be reduced to poultry. It showed in a series of paperwork, reports, and articles related to a series of endangered species. The literature that exhibits a lot of degree of quality, they found a review of three major flaws. First, the argument carried upon the poor knowledge and command of economic theory. Second, the literature in favor of trade is not rigorous in the need to support assertions with hard data. And lastly, is the ignorance of the social, economic, and institutional context in which trade would take place. The economic decisions involve much more than simple reactions to prices. In our review, we found a small but significant set of scientific literature on the issue of wildlife trade and the effects of legalization on poaching published in specialized peer-reviewed economic journals. This literature has identified three types of market configurations under which trade legalization fails to reduce poaching. If legalization reduces the social stigma associated with the consumption of legal productions, the legalization of wildlife trade can bring in new consumers and expand the quantity demanded to an extent that poaching is not reduced. Thank you for discussing about the International Rhino Fund. We may now proceed with the different ways on protecting the endangered animal species by Ms. Villaflor and Ms. Yao. Good morning, everyone. Today, we are going to talk about different ways on protecting the endangered animal species. As researched by Emily Kutu and Sai Almat, an effective way and internationally recognized 
strategy to conserve the species is to designate protected areas. The United Nations Environment Program World Conservation Monitoring Center, also known as UNEP WCMC, defines that a protected area as an area of land and or sea, especially located to the protection of biological diversity and of natural and associated cultural resources that manage through um, legal or other effective means. Although the worldwide extensive systems of protected areas have been developed and include national parks, state or provincial parks, wildlife refugees, and nature reserves, all of which differ in their management objectives and degree of protection. Furthermore, the IUCN has defined six protected area management categories. This is based on primary management objectives. These categories are defined in detail in the guidelines for protected areas, ma areas management categories that is published in IUCN in 1994. I think that strict nature reserve management could help protect species that are endangered. This is where protected area is managed mainly for science, meaning an area of land or sea possessing some of um, outstanding or representative ecosystem, geological or physiological features. Our species available are primarily for scientific research and environmental monitoring. This is helpful because they could really take care of these species and learn more and share knowledge about them to humans. Also, wilderness area could help protect endangered species by protecting its natural habitat or serving their home. Wilderness area is where uh, the protected area is managed mainly for wilderness protection is where the large area of unmodified or slightly modified land sea is retaining its natural character and influence without permanent or significant habitation, which is uh, protected and managed to preserve its cultural natural condition, and many more protected areas that are managed by the IUCN. I found out that there are a variety of methods currently being intended, implemented to save endangered species. The most captive, the most common are creation of protected areas or um, captive breathing or introduction conserving legislation and increase public awareness. Captive breathing and reintroduction are where some species that are endangered, in danger of extinction in the wild are brought into captivity to, their, to either safeguard against imminent extinction or to increase population number. According to Ebenhardt, the goals of captive breathing programs are to establish population via controlled breathing uh, uh, that are large enough to be demographically stable and genetically, genetically healthy. This is already successful captive breathing. Uh, it includes Guam rail, Skimtar horn ornix, or Brzezowski horse. Another goal of some captive breeding programs is to reintroduce animals to the wild. This is to establish populations and this is to establish populations and to uh, rest that uh, the example of successful introdu introduction ceasing captive breed stock is the California condors and black footed parrots. Um, furthermore, reintroductions can also utilize individuals from healthy wild population, meaning these individuals that are thriving in one part of the range are introduced to an area where the species was extirpated. Uh, reintroduction programs also the one who is involved in the release of individuals back into portions of their historic range where they are monitored and roam the wild freely. A researcher and wildlife biologist from the university the University of Montana, Tammy Maldenstein, made a study entitled Habitat Selection of Large Flying Foxes Using Radio Telemetry, targeting conservation efforts in Subic Bay, Philippines, which was made in 2002. 
It's not very often we see studies relating and providing information that would help with the Philippines' conservation of endangered species such as animals and plants. Despite Philippines being a highly biodiverse and endemism country with its range of species, we are not as focused as protecting and has little commitment in conserving our endangered and threatened species. Her study was very inspiring and insightful. There were so many things that I can quote from her study as she is very passionate in giving her research of giving possible answers to important ecological questions and pick a topic that will or may benefit the study of the species of the species of the large flying bats. Which again would be a great contribution to the Philippines conservation efforts. In the making of her research, she worked in tandem with Sam Steyer, as she stated that both of the research may not be the same, but are complementary as they both work together to make this study in fruition. <clears throat> Magenstein's research mainly focused on the habitats of a few species of flying foxes, such as two large fruit bats, a species of the member of a single family named Cheropodidae in the Mycocopteran suborder, which lives in sub which lives in Subic Bay, where one, of the where one of the species' last roots are. Even though fruit bats are threatened and endangered, not much is known about them and are rarely recorded, which is why Maldenstein came to Subic Bay to give helpful information about them, including with the intent of providing information so it would be easier to monitor them from illegal hunting and habitat loss and other threats and also because this research would offer training opportunities for Filipino counterparts. To give context as to understanding what or who oversees the endangered species, specifically in Subic Bay, it is the SBMA, Subic Bay Metropolitan Authority Ecology Center, which is managed by the local government. Subic Bay was once the site of the largest overseas U.S. Na naval base but is now a national protected area that was declared in 1992. Despite its Navy's presence, it is arguably positive to the forest. The forest is located here. And, uh, the forest located here is one of the last large tracts of lowland old growth forest in the country, which consists of a variety of biodiverse species. When the study was conducted, it is worth noting that the ecology that the eco Ecology Center was not a well equipped, was not as well equipped, knowledgeable, or know how to start a prior conserving and preserving the species. As stated by Maldenstein, the Ecolo Ecology Center also lacks the essential, such as inventory of their wildlife, conservation management plans, and research projects and trained biologists. But because people are not familiar with the needs and animal behaviors of fruit bats, Maldenstein states that it was hard to convince the cons conservation managers as some of them believe that in myths such as deforesting is not a threat to the fruit bats. One of the many threats of fruit bats were unregulated hunting and habitat loss. But what is the importance of fruit bats? Fruit bats are, ecologically key are, are ecological keystones. They are pollinators and seed dispensers and help with the forest regeneration. Because they maintain the forest, they also most likely have an indirect importance to the econ economy. They also inspire eco-tourists to help donate in conservation projects. As stated in her study, she was able to locate where fruit bats reside as she used two methods. One was capturing them and tracking them to settle in their habitat. In capturing them, they use mist netting and capturing procedures and tracking them with radio tracking and telemetry. But don't worry, since they made sure the bats were healthy and properly cared for before setting them free. The result of this study were that their homes cover a mix of artificial, disturbed, and remnants of natural forests at most colony sites. But not once did they record that they were near any residential or grassland areas. But they suggest that the mix location may be the cause of depletion in the country lowland forest to more than 90%. In conservation and protecting, it's very important to know and understand, especially their habitats. As I read through her study, it opened my eyes to some of the facts that she was able to show. She interviewed local naturalists and bat hunters. One of the facts and results were that 
even the very people who were supposed to protect the, sale, the said endangered wildlife were also the ones who took advantage of their position and harmed those poor species. Some of the construction workers and guards were reportedly held some of the construction workers and guards were reportedly and have been seen firsthand that they cut the mangrove trees for cooking fuel, fishing protected and uh, fishing from protected waters, and hunting in protected forests. Though it's not just the rangers, workers, or people who have access who are taking opportunities in this conservation in Subic Bay, as some opportunists are also the reason why. Also, a quick note is that many threats given were suggested that it. Also, a quick note it <laughs> is that the many threats given were suggested that it was not because of poverty, but because of human greed, poor management, and corruption. The likes of many threats, such as illegal logging, poaching, and many more. Madenstein quotes Crummer, 1991, It is clear that the relationship between population abundance and destruction of natural forests is complex and only meaningful when government management efforts are considered. But hunting is not allowed and is considered illegal when done by a non-indigenous Filipino, though it's not widely publicized or enforced by the country. And it's sad to say that both indigenous and non-indigenous Filipino hunt, uh, hunt fruit bats, and it's not unknown as to many what, as to many enough uh, as to how many one of the other hunts per year. Aside from this, it is also stated that the Filipino bat hunters no interest in the. Uh, show interest in the conservation of fruit bats as they favor ano, ano, even though they favor hunting regulations ano, it's because the, they in, they enjoy and hope to continue to enjoy their sport hunting because of her research i can easily say that the best way in protecting an ano, endangered species is through knowing spreading information aware ano, and awareness publicly it is true that most of us are not as knowledgeable about our country species in plants and animals, both threatened and endangered. And even if we know that a certain type of species in, is in fact endangered and at the brink of extinction, we cannot say for certain if we know about them. Like fruit bats, there were, no, uh, no, there were not much known information about them, both virtually and in paper. It would be much better if more research was done locally and directed about the country's conservation method as this would provide information about endangered species, both animals and plants, and possibly help with the ways in monitoring, protecting, and preserving them. Groups and other conservation experts can easily and effectively do their job and have a better jo uh, no, job or chance in giving the animals a uh, fighting chance. This can also reduce poaching and prevent any more damages to the animal's natural habitat and to their population. Wow, that's a very um informative um subtopics for our for our session today in in regards to the endangered animal species. So um overall from what we learned from this from the speeches that the researchers gave, don't you think that we have lost enough? We have lost rainforests part of the ozone layer, most of our natural resources, and now we are going to lose animals too, at least more animals that, than what we have already lost. An endangered species is a population of organisms which are at risk of becoming extinct because they are either few in numbers or threatened by changing environmental or pred predation parameters. Animals can get endangered or extinct naturally or from human reasons. It can happen naturally from natural competition or from natural disasters. Natural competition is when species compete for food and or living spaces. An example of an animal species affected by this is the mussel. Natural disasters can wipe out or endanger a whole species. An example of animal species affected by natural disaster was the dinosaur. 
If the theory is true, the meteor that crashed down to the Earth wiped out the whole species. We also have contributed to animals getting endangered too. The, po the pollution that we create damages many animal habitats. An example of an animal that has been affected by our pollution is the sea turtle. Overhunting is also a huge threat. When people overhunt, they hunt too much of an animal species. So either not many animals left or no animals are left at all. Examples of some other hunted animals are the Bali tiger and the Atlantic cod. Clear cutting is also very dangerous for the animals. It destroys animals' habitats and leaves them with no place to live. live. Examples of some animals that have been affected by clear cutting are the many species in the Amazon rainforest. When huge corporations cut down sections of the rainforest of the rain of the rainforest, many animals lose their homes. So animals become endangered before they become extinct. Endangered animals have to be very well protected because if we do not take care of the few ones that are left off one species, the whole species could disappear completely. Examples of some endangered animals are the sea otter, the panda bear, the Siberian tiger, the American bison, the mountain gorilla, and the Liberian lynx. Many other living things are in big danger of becoming extinct. There are at least a thousand different species of mammals and birds that are extremely rare today. No one can even possibly try to guess the number of insect and plant species in danger. For many centuries, animals have been made extinct because of human overhunting or other reasons. During the last 350 years, 95 different bird species and 40 different mammal species have been extinct. Examples of some extinct animals are 580, the giant lemur, about 1,080, the flightless ibis, about 1,500, the giant moa, 1627, the arauk, arauk. 1681, the dodo, 1883, the quagga, 1994, passenger, passenger pigeon, 1918, Carolina parakeet. Should the list go on? So many, right? Many. Many organizations such as WWF, World Wildlife Fund, are focused on helping animals and the environment. They try to be actively eco-friendly, try to get the habitats for many endangered plants and animals protected. They do research on the species. They educate people um, and etc. Zoos also help. They let many endangered species thrive and reproduce in a healthy and safe environment. Sometimes the zoo might even let an endangered animal go back into the wild to try to raise population numbers again. Not only can the big organizations help, you can do. You can donate money or you could volunteer or contact your local organization to get involved or you could do the simplest thing of all. Care for the environment. As you can see, we have most of the fault in animals getting endangered and extinct. This is now becoming a global issue, but most people are finally taking notice. Do you really want more animals disappearing? Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful and amazing summarization. We have learned so much from that. It is truly great knowing that there are possible ways to help preserve the endangered species of both plants and animals. We'll be having a lunch break for a while, so stay tuned for the next part of the symposium. Thank you and good morning again. Good afternoon once again. We are back to our symposium, and this time our topic will be the pros and cons of genetic genetic engineering. The third session for our symposium is about the pros of genetic engineering. This will be introduced by our keynote speakers, Ms. Damaso and Mr. Gaon. Greetings everyone, I'm Christina Alisa Damaso and I'll be one of the keynote speakers for this afternoon. So Mr. Gaon, what are your thoughts or what are your ideas about genetic engineering? Good afternoon, everyone. Genetic engineering means the deliberate manipula manipulation of an organism's genetic material to change its feature. Genetic engineering is a collection of techniques that use for combination of DNA to directly modify the genetic, genetic makeup of animal or population of organisms. 
These methods are used to identify, reproduce, change, and transfer genetic material from cells, tissues, or entire organisms. We also have genetic engineering in plants and animals, which will be further discussed by speakers this afternoon. Yes, I agree with that, Mr. Gaum. We also have three types of genetic engineering or some major methods. First, we have microinjection of DNA into the nucleus of anchored cells. We have electroporation where DNA is introduced through cell membrane pores by pulse electrical charges and polycationic neutralization of the cell membrane and the DNA to be introduced to improve passive uptake. On the other hand, we also have genetic engineering in animals, which will be further discussed this afternoon. Scientists are now capable of creating new species of animals by taking genetic material from one or more plants or animals and genetically engineering them into the genes of another animal. Yes, I agree with, with your statement. We now proceed to genetic engineering in plants. Plants can a specific stretch of DNA into the name of a plant to give it a new. This could involve plant growth therapy. That engineering allows science to produce new foods, create on plants, and plant resistance and extended life. Thank you to our wonderful keynote speakers. Now we may proceed to the first subtopic, which is about the genetic engineering in animals. Good afternoon, our humble audience. We will now start our discussion about genetic engineering in animals. For this segment, me and my partner will be determining whether genetic engineering is a lot more harmful than it seems, or is it actually a good idea to be doing this in modern society? What do you think, Labau? Well, to be honest, we all know there would be negative consequences in any action. But there is also a lot of things to consider here. So to officially start off with our dis discussion, how does genetic engineering in animals work? And how is it that the method is beneficial through the topic in question? Well, as as far as my knowledge goes, scientists have synthesized the use of the genes or of organisms and directly control and manipulate it. As a result, thanks to this technology, the scientists have been able to transfer the beneficial genes of one animal species to another. As scientists have sequenced the genomes of domestic animals, more is known about genes and the traits that they control. By finding genes that control beneficial traits, they can precisely introduce those genes into another animal's genome, so the GE animal will possess that trait. One example is the Enviro pig. Through genetic engineering, this animal emits 30 to 60% less phosphorus than traditional pigs fed the same conventional diet. This lessens the livestock's impact in the environment. This proves that, that genetic engineering can be life-changing to the agriculture standpoint and perhaps giving many new possibilities for farmers to exploit more possible tools for them. Yes, I can agree with you on that. It's certainly fascinating seeing how our agriculture can evolve through many years from now and over time, it is now currently capable of surpassing the major difficulties from when it comes to animal agriculture, thanks to the modern technology we have today. Over the past 30 years, biotechnological developments have allowed scientists to alter the genetic makeup of bacteria, plants, and animals. Initially, these modifications have served the purpose of basic research, but these techniques quickly became promising tools from agriculture point of view since they allowed the addition of novel traits to organisms which may increase their suitability for use in extensive monocultures. For example, with the use of genetic engineering, scientists can develop a new given traits for animals to live a healthy good life using man-made tools. Among the traits scientists are tackling are animal health, disease tolerance, growth rate, improvement of meat quality, 
milk composition, and increased wool production. In addition, the reduction of the impact of animal culture on the environment is also being tackled for alongside it. This can certainly impact the future of modern agriculture to the next level, wouldn't you say, Javier? Of course, there's already more evidence that scientists have proven from time to time that with genetic engineering, it can be a huge benefit for farmers if they invest and accept this new norm of agriculture and apply it to their business. In short, we can agree that it's for the best that we rely on the technology of genetic engineering for the future of our agriculture to flourish for new ways to evolve over time. And as such, scientists would still have to keep working hard to find more new possible ways to exploit more profound leverages to give farmers an easier time to work around their existing technology and their working environment. So as Javier has said there, there is already evidence that genetic engineering is a benefit for farmers if they accept the new norm of agriculture. We will now give examples like aside from the EnviroPig, there is also the transgenic chips that can produce better wool through genetic engineering and as well as cows that were engineered to convert grain more efficiently into higher quality milk and meat. These, uh, These are certainly some great improvements as we can see because of genetic engineering. Animals become healthier than they originally were. Of course, when we mention this, we will now give you some of the diseases that can be cured through genetic engineering. Starting off from cystic fibrosis, this disease is a hereditary disease that affects the lungs and digestive system. Another one is muscular dystrophy, which is a group of inherited diseases that damage and weaken muscles over time. There's also that thing called Down syndrome, and I think it's a condition when there is an extra 21st chromosome. This syndrome causes Alzheimer's disease, I believe. So in short, genetic engineering does have its perks much more than we initially thought. To end this in a flash, we what do we have to say about this? Well, in my opinion, to have cured these set of diseases from just genetic engineering alone, Alone, it is quite a big advantage that we have this kind of thing going on in modern society because we have faced a lot of problems in terms of agricultural industry and genetic diseases. Now we have genetic engineering as one of our solutions. That's right. Now that we have discussed what we know, we can now proceed to the next presenters. So that's it for our discussion. Good day, everyone. We are now going to start to discuss the topic about genetic engineering in plants. Throughout history, humans have been using or testing from traditional to modern methods like selective breeding and crossbreeding to animals and plants that is still improving for it to be more suitable to our changing environment. Like for example, the plants or fruits has, has, our, has changed in appearance and nutrients compared to the past years and like now, it is more appealing and more nutritious as scientists confirm. According to the U.S. Department of, according to the US Department of Agriculture, GMO seeds are used to plant over 90% of all maize, cotton, and soy grown in the United States, which means that many of the foods we likely, we likely eat contains GMO. But how does genetic engineering mod or modification happen in plants? Genetic modification of plants involves adding a specific stretch of DNA into the plant's genome, giving it new or different characteristics. This could include changing the way the plants grow or making it resistant to a particular disease. The new DNA becomes part of the GM's plant's genome, which, has, which the seeds produced by this plant will con contain. Thus, it will, become a, it will become a transgenic plant. But how does genetic modified plants or transgenic plants can be, be beneficial for us? GMO practices can be used to produce designer crops, which we have more nutrients, grows quicker, produce more yield, and are more resistant to pesticides and useless fertilizer. 
artificially implanting DNA from one species to another can save, can save many, many years of research. Waiting for the unpredictable nature of traditional breeding methods can take decades to achieve the required equilibrium. Such a goal can be reached instantaneously with GMO. Altering the plants or crops to be more superior compared to the past is a genius move from the humans. Since our population is increasing, we need plants that can grow faster and does not need to use toxic chemicals to kill borers. In addition, new diseases are also mutating. We need plants that are used for making medicine to encounter it. Therefore, we need to use GMO to make the plants more powerful and more nutritious for our body to handle. Overall, GMO crops are more beneficial than risky. We can produce more food due to our genetically modified crops that can survive in a variety of climates. While the risks are few, the benefits are abundant. As responsible consumers, we have a right to know exactly what we are purchasing, and we need to be the we need to be given the correct information to make fully informed decisions. Let us now go on with a genetically modified organism by Mr. Luman Ag and Ms. Malyari. Good day, everyone. I am Ivan Luman Ag, and I will be the first speaker on behalf of us. With, along with Jasper Maliari. Uh, as stated in the article by Ryan Ramad, MSRD entitled GMOs, Pros and Cons Backed, with, backed by Evidence, the pros of having genet genetically modified organism is that the fact that it gives advantages to both the grower and consumer. He did mention for a fact that some GMOs are modified to protect itself, making it less work for the grower and less usage of toxins that are very harmful to health of both growers and consumers. Evidence is showing it may be usage of chemicals almost half within a single year. Another example of a GMO that could cut the, the use of other chemicals up to almost no use at all. Almost obsolete of chem chemical use uh, are a very good outcome of this GMO making it 90% healthier compared to other compared to other crops it is the disease resistant potato other countries also has modified crops to withstand harmful conditions to have a stable income even within droughts blights etc these examples for factors for both help the farmers to have better crop yield, crop yield or income on their behalf and the consumers to have more stock or food consume even in tough conditions. Less use of external factors makes the crops less costly. These are just examples for some strengthen strengthening modifications. There can also be certain modifications to use for altering the flavor a bit and even its appearance. One example given by the article is the non-browning apple. With these samples of modifications asking, is it safe for consumption? Well, as it, as it is given by evidences, yes, it is safe for consumption at any age on that we have. Recent researches shows that no side effects of eating these types of GMOs. Doctors have stated their points of views that eating GMOs has a good impact on consumers for the fact that usage of chemicals have been lessened makes the consumption safer, like the Bt corn that need not to have insecticides to protect itself. Sure, it was debated that consuming GMOs could lead to having cancer or tumors faster, but as soon as it was created, it was already wrong, for the construct was not good and was biased. Therefore, it was proven that present GMOs have no connection to having cancer and tumors in short, GMOs are easier to grow and less costly for farmers, making the price and production cheaper. As for my opinion, I do think that GMOs are rel relatively safe and easier to grow. The fact that they don't have to worry about dangerous pests and using chemicals, making it also cheaper. 
With that said, I believe that if you use GMO instead of normal crops for production, I think that that is the best way for production. The debatable idea of its danger has been wrong, so I see no problem growing these types of GMOs and eating them. In 2015, 26 plant species have been modified and approved. That is all on my behalf in foreign studies. Now let's listen to my partner. Thank you for the information that you have given Mr. Loman Ag and hello and good afternoon everyone. I am Jasper Jade Miliari and here we are now on the genetically modified organism in the Philippines. The meaning of GMO was already mentioned by Mr. Loman Ag, so I actually won't go any further now. So here we go based on the article that was written by Nikechi Isaac. The Philippines was the first ever country in Southeast Asia that approved on the commercial cultivation of a genetically modified crop for feed and food. Some or a lot of us know that there are a lot of borers in a cornfield in which those insects destroy or eat what farmers plant, thus making the farmers worried for their own crops. But then the PT corn appeared. PT corn, also known as Bacillus thuringiensis, is a genetically modified pest resistant in the Philippines. It is designed to be resistant to the Asiatic corn borer known as Ostrinia furnacalis, one of the nation's most destructive corn pests. The crop itself also represents a practical and ecologically sustainable solution for corn corn, poor corn farmers everywhere. Though before this PT corn was not that well known yet, there are some farmers who claim that these GM GMOs cause health problems. In my opinion, I think that those farmers were just scared and not too sure if a new technolo technology for farming really is safe. So they said such things to prevent other farmers to use it. But when BT corn was approved in the year 2003, farmers started to try planting BT corns. And then when they were able to get hold of BT technology, the farmer shared the information from one farming site to another site because they saw that the benefit from planting BT corns are tremendous. Today, more than 400,000 farmers are planting BT corn in the Philippines. It helped a lot of farmers to increase their yields and disease pesticide use. It also helped the farmers to improve their health and livelihoods, alleviating poverty. In addition, BT corns aren't just the only BT products in the Philippines. There are also BT cotton, eggplant, golden rice, which Filipinos also support. And if I would get to choose and plant between BT corns and just ordinary corns, I would choose BT corns. As what other people say, modern problems require modern solutions. We need modern technology for, for our agriculture to improve. I also am giving thanks to BT technology for inventing something like this. It helped a lot of farmers, including the economy of our country. And I guess that will be all for me and for my partner, Mr. Luman Ag. Thank you. Thank you for discussing about the genetically modified organisms. Let us now get on with the ethical and well-focused concerns for genetically engineered plants and animals by Ms. Marquez and Ms. Martinez. Hello, everyone. So, <clears throat> so to start off, genetically modified plants, also called transgenic plants, are designed to acquire useful quality attributes such as insect resistance, herbicide tolerance, abiotic stress tolerance, disease resistance, high nutritional quality, high yield potential, and delayed <clears throat> ripening. Um, there are also enhanced ornamental value for those who like to collect plants and to, and to increase the commercial value and male sterility in some plants and even production of edible vaccines. Which, might be, which we all might be familiar of as of late. And another major goal for raising these genetically modified plants is their applications by reactors for reduction of nutraceuticals, therapeutic agents, and so forth. Thus, such plants can potentially affect many aspects of modern society itself, including agriculture, production, and medical treatment. 
And despite these potential applications, the use of GM plants for human welfare has been restricted owing to various concerns raised by public and the critics. And these concerns are divided into different categories, namely health, nutritional, environmental, ecological, socioeconomic, and even ethical concerns, as which is the title of our group's um, topic today. If agriculture biotechnology can help family farms in rural communities and improve food quality, safety, security, then from both utilitarian excuse me, utilitarian and humanitarian perspectives, it is ethically acceptable. But the environmental and public costs of an increasingly genetically and anomalous contaminated and an adulterated food chain compounded by industrial pollution, agricultural chemicals are likely to continue to rise as consequence of biotechnology being applied as a techno fix for conventional but non-sustainable for us that of an industrial agriculture from an economistic perspective. This is very good for us because it means the sale of more drugs, biomedical technologies to treat consumers and even domestic animals who develop a variety of health problems from uh, variously from variously contaminated and nutrient, defi nutrient deficient foods from an unhealthy diet that is based primarily on animal fat and protein. <laughs> Concern, so these are some concerns related to health and self and nutritional status, which pertains to ethical and welfare concerns from the public and even critics. So in the case of um, genetically modified plants, especially consumed by us humans and animals, there's always a fear and risk in the society that these type of plants can potentially create health problems or may lead to the development of newer microbial strains that might that may be pathogenic. So furthermore, the plants themselves may be susceptible to such risks and public and the critics are skeptical about the nut nutritional content and quality of such modified plants. And so there's also the susceptibility to allergens and even other risks. One of the major distressing problems with non-traditional proteins and GM foods is risk of introducing allergens, usually glycoproteins into the food supply of humans and animals. The public is concerned about the nature of these new food proteins as their allergenic or non-allergenic qualities are mostly unknown. An example of allergenicity has been demonstrated in transgenic soybeans to the transfer of a major food allergen from Brazil nuts. On the other hand, at the time, the scientists believed that the food or the transgenic soybeans are found only in a few defined sources, peanut and other grain uh, legumes, shellfish, tree nuts, etc. Hence, only a dozen foods may produce allergenic reactions. Moreover, allergenicity occurs when these uh, food allergens are present in large proportions of the food and individuals are synthesized to them over time to cause any adverse aspect to, to any adverse effects that is highly unlikely for new allergens to be introduced into food supply from genetically modified plants. But there's also a, another risk related to the ability of such plants to create new toxic or, organisms. It is speculated that some non-pest microbial strains may acquire pathogenic traits by gene flow from genetically modified plants. The risk can also be a new host being affected by a virus or recombining to form an even more deadly and virulent virus. Some plant pathologists also hypothesize that development of virus resistant plants may allow viruses to infect new hosts through transcapsidation. And virus resistant plants may also lead to the creation of new viruses even through exchange of genetic material or recombination between RNA virus genomes as you know see the virus like we know that coronavirus there's a new variant called the UK variant so we can see how quickly it can be devastating in the population and so large-scale cultivation of uh of transgenic plants expressing viral and bacterial genes and the release into the environment, considered to be a threat and even called a genetic pollution by critics. The risk of transgene spreading the environment related to the likelihood for outcrossing, um, horizontal gene transfer, and the phenotype, or the phenotype, which means like the physical appearance um, of the plant itself imparted by the gene. Various concerns risen to the application and release of such plants into the environment. It should, however, be acknowledged that agriculture inevitably has an impact on the environment, and these concerns are not specific for just genetically modified plants. <clears throat> but 
But of course, it is possible that the widespread use of disease resistant um, genetically modified plants may lead to the evolution of several insect pests that become resistant to pesticides. For example, the Bacillus thuringiensis, or BT crops for short, are plants genetically engineered or modified to contain the endospore or some certain toxins of the bacterium BD, BT to be resistant to certain insect pests. Such crops develop resistance to a biopesticide permitted by pesticide successfully used by organic farmers in the integrated pest management programs. But there is to there is to data no reported evidence of insect resistance to crops under field conditions, although it is although such resistant plants like the cotton budworm and bollworm have been observed in areas where the biopesticides are spread on crops. It has been a matter of concern that development of such resistance may lead to the loss of, of the potential uh, of the potential of the BT biopesticide, which may in turn make it necessary for such organic farmers resorting to less environmentally acceptable chemical pesticides. Therefore, proper resistance management strategies, along with this comparatively newer technology, are still somewhat imperative. So tonight, to conclude, as part of the, of the ethical and welfare concerns over transgenic plants, like for us as the most dominant species on this planet, the input of like public opinion regarding the application of and development of such genetic engineering is an important factor in influencing the future development of the of this technology and its application within the commercial sector, especially, it is probably the most vulnerable, especially when you have to consider like, like in the public and individuals who are not knowledgeable enough about the risks. And like in this direction, a combination of demographic data from existing non-GM populations, simulation modeling of such um, transgene dispersal and their monitoring field releases may guide in the assessment of the risks related to the release of such plants into the environment. And in further, it's reviewed that by case by case studies can even help in solving race concerns in terms of our ethical and welfare concerns. Though the public should be well informed that most of their concerns are still somewhat skeptical, not all of them. Um, there are some that are that are valid and should be considered. And but still there are some that that may not be informed enough to be accurate. And genetically modified plants still retain tremendous potential and in solving even present problems we face today, which is why we have it in the first place. But it is still important that we do consider, we, we do, excuse me, we, do, we still need to consider the risk and what kind of, uh, what kind of unknown information or um, unknown information or, <clears throat> um, or paths we're going to take that, that we may not have ever discovered of ourselves. So thus, um, so thus, like, like the, it's the question is like, are are the uh, do the cons or the do the cons outweigh the pros themselves? Like in my opinion, I think I I think the I think the pros or the benefits do, can still outweigh the cons because, as I said earlier, um. It can still, it can still, it can, it can, genetically modified plants have actually been, been, been somewhat relevant today. Um, some of you may have heard of like the banana. Have you seen, if you've seen pictures of what it used to look like? The banana used to have like tiny, used to have, used to have like a lot of larger different seeds or it didn't have much, it had a radically different, it had a radically different appearance. But if we have today, like we've seen it so much that it's that it's imprinted into our mind that it's this long yellow fruit that we associate to some animals like the monkeys or that we eat it because of its proteins or healthy fruit. But it has been somewhat modified enough that that it's and then it's some of that. So that benefit kind of outweighs any cons of it, that it might have existed. It doesn't apply to every genetically modified topic or subject that matter. Sometimes some some things do have more consequences than the benefits that we're hoping to be reaped from it. And so, so in all in all, it is like it is recommended that scientific research aimed at such risk analysis, which is very important, prediction and prevention of such disasters possibly, combined with adequate monitoring and stewardship and 
and uh, in consistently being honest with the results, you know, just hiding any negative effects just for the sake of of our own, of our own benefit, especially economically. Um, and it has been must it has be it has to be done so that the negative impact of such topics or of such of such potential can can be men can can still be kept at the minimum. Even though we may not be able to, to control the future, we can still be in charge of our own choices and hope and do the best we can at the moment. So that's all. And I would like to um, uh, pass over the torch to Ms. Martinez and to Nina Stark. So good afternoon. Um, basically, since since Ms. Jennifer already tackled all about these particular topics, maybe I. I will be the one who will be um, balancing things out during the prawns. This is our not primarily are the pros, but but in the end there are some conclusions that we sought out, so we can balance the pros, not just to fill it with some flowery words that we can do. So, but anyway, so the ethical issues including animal welfare concerns can arise at all stages of the generation and lifespan of a single genetically engineered animal. The accepted ethics of the use of animals in science, which includes the principle of the three, three R's, reduction of animal numbers, refinement of practices and farming to minimize pain and discomfort, and replacement of animals with non-alternative where, where possible. Together, the three are seek to reduce any pain and anguish experienced by the animal's use, and such are considered to be the principles of humane experimental technique. But however, despite of the measures taken, taken to minimize pain and suffering, there are signs of public concern that went beyond the three R's. So one of the concerns of, of for animal for animal welfare are the invasiveness of procedures. It is the generation of a new line of genetically engineered animals are often involves the sacrifice of, of some animals and surgical procedures on others. These procedures are not exclusive to genetically engineered animals but are often necessary for their production. Next is the large number of animals required. Many of the embryos subjected to genetic to genetic engineered procedures do not survive, and among those who survive only a small proportion, between 1% to 30%, carry the genetic alteration of interest. This means that a large number of animals are, are produced to obtain genetically engineered animals of scientific value, which contradicts efforts to minimize the use of animals. Furthermore, the process of genetic engineering technologies in recent years must lead to a rapid increase in the number of varieties of genetically engineered animals, in, par in particular mice. The rise in animal use challenges the three R's principle of reduction. Lastly is the unanticipated un un welfare concerns. Few data were collected on net impacts on the well-being of genetically modified animals or animals necessary for their creation, and genetic engineering techniques were described as unpredictable and ineffective. For example, many of, many of the first transgenic breeding studies have produced animals with a series of unexpected side effects, including leanness, stress, and fertility reduction. A significant limitation of current cloning technology is the possibility that cloned descendants may suffer some degree of art of abnormality. Studies have shown that cloned mammals may suffer development abnormalities, including prolonged gestation, high birth weight, inadequate placental formation, and histological effects on organs and tissues. <clears throat> Genetically engineered animals, even those that handle the same gene, may have a variety of phenotypes. Some do not cause welfare 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 problems and some others cause negative impacts on well-being. It is often difficult to predict the effects that a certain genetic modification may have 
on a particular animal so that genetically modified animals need to be closely monitored to mitigate unforeseen well-being problems as they arise. Therefore, genetic engineering procedures can become less than a welfare concern over time. That's, that will be all in my discussion. Thank you. Thank you for that, speakers. Now let's have a summary and let's share our insights about what they talked about. I've noticed that generic, genetic engineering reduces drug production, which is a good thing, and it really enhances the nutrient composition and the food quality. It helps to secure food for the people. Example is developing pest resistance. Without genetic engineering, people would lead to malnutrition. I think that gener gene genetic engineering is also a good way when it comes to fighting health problems such as cystic fibrosis, diabetes, and several other diseases. There are plants that lack water and fertilizer. With this one, genetic engineering helps drought-resistant plants that require fewer environmental resources like water and fertilizer. How about you, Mr. Gaum? To conclude, I see genetic engineering as a beneficial than risky because it benefits us in many ways. This concludes tastier food, healthier and nutritious foods. Not only can it can benefit the consumers but the farmers as well. Crops, of, crops have also had better resistance to pests and diseases. Less insecticides and other chemicals are needed to protect them from insects. This results in more safer and nutritious foods. Several studies on genetic engineering have been completed with an emphasis on its re relevance ranging from enhancing plant and animal food production, identifying illness condition, improving medical treatment, and producing vaccines and other valuable medication. We could grow food by clearing more and more forests to create fields and pastures by using pesticides, or we do it on the land that we've got right now with more, eff with more eff effective methods like GM crops. Intensifying farming instead of expanding means GMOs could be the new organic. GMO have the potential to not only drastically change agriculture, but to also dampen the effects of our irresponsible behavior. GMO could be the most powerful weapon to save our biosphere. Thank you. Thank you for discussing, discussing the genetically modified organisms. We may now have our break time. The symposium will be back right after a few minutes. Good afternoon. Welcome back to the symposium of DG Arts 111. We will now begin with the fourth session, which is about the cons of genetic engineering, which will be introduced by our keynote speakers, Mr. Galvez and Mr. Gonzalez. Hi, I'm Jericho Gonzalez. And I'm Joe Galvez. Anyways, what our main what is our main topic that will be discussed by our class later? The cons of genetic engineering, Jericho. Okay, can you state some examples? Yes, of course. Less nutritional value concerns regarding the nutritional value of the products stems from the fact that some products can grow big and quickly at the cost of decreasing their nutritional value. And also uh, risky pathogens because viruses and bacteria adapt to the environment. And of course, negative side effects, for example, uh, you can modify a plant to need less water, but that would make it intolerant to, the, to direct sunlight. So those are some examples. What about you, Jerica? Well, perhaps some more obvious than the pros of genetic engineering, there are a number of disadvantages to allowing scientists, scientists to break down barriers that perhaps are better left untouched. Here are just a few of those disadvantages. Reduce nutritional value. It may grow concerns regarding the nutritional value of the product as some product can grow big quickly at the cost of decreasing their nutritional value. Risky pathogen. Virus and bacteria adapt to the environment when this when these cannot get through the natural repellent of the genetically altered plant, these can grow stronger and more resistant. Negatively affecting non-genetically engineered plants, animals. Negative side effect. Genetic engineering helps to 
solve an issue by transforming genes to the organism that will help it to combat the problems. Sometimes genes can cause side effects. For instance, a plant can be modified that it needs less water, but that would make it intolerant to direct sunlight. Nature is extremely complex, interrelated gene. It is believed it is believed by some scientists that the introduction of genetically modified genes may have an irreversible effect with consequences not yet known. Now, we'll state the topics that will be discussed later on. Alright, the first topic that we will be discussed is genetic error created by genetic engineering. Ju, can you give a brief explanation to this? Um, from the word error, we know that there can also be problems regarding the process of genetic engineering. There are many risks involved in genetic engineering. Uh, the release of genetically altered organisms in the environment can increase human suffering, decrease animal welfare, and lead to ecological disasters. And thank you for explanation. Now let's move on to are genetically engineered animals necessary in agriculture? Genetic engineered animals hold great potential in the field of agriculture. It can increase the yields of farm animals. What a wonderful presentation. Well, then next up is preserving the natural habitats of endangered animal species. How can we preserve their habitats and how can we help to prevent the extinction of these poor endangered animals? Fantastic work. Now, with the last topic for today, is food safety and environment concerns of genetically engineered farm animals. Genetic engineered animals may cause some animals to become invasive or toxic to wildlife. Now, let's move on to the researchers. And explore the cons of genetic engineering furthermore. Thank you to our keynote speakers for that wonderful discussion. Let us now proceed with the genetic errors created by genetic engineering process by Ms. Mercado and Ms. Onrubia. Hello everyone, and today we are, we are going to talk about the, the genetic errors created by genetic engineering. Gene editing, gene editing techniques are promoted as being more precise than first gener generation genetic engineering. But errors can result in unexpected and unintended effect effects in resulting GMO. This could cause changes in protein and composition profile that could affect food safety. Both book of concept papers have examined gene edited animals for changes in their DNA. The insertion of DNA can cause section of the animal's own DNA to become re rearranged, as has often happened with standards genetically engineered crops. Although these genetic errors have been observed in genetically engineered plants, they are far less well known. Far, far less well known in animals because detailed studies have largely not even not been performed however before. However, unexpected effects can occur. One study tried to eliminate a known allergen in cow's milk through genetic engineering involving gen gene insertion found in also effect in level of all the other milk protein. And one calf was even born without a tail. Although the exact cause of this is unexpected effect is unknown. Most studies look looking at potential gene edited animals. In farming consider off target effect to be both a major challenges challenge and major concern. With gene editing, although genes may not be inserted gene errors can still be generated. One of, one of the main ways that gene editing can be imprecise is by causing off-target effect. Off-target effect can, could unintentionally alter important genes causing changes in chemistry or potential production. 
The implication of these off target effects to animals' welfare, welfare or food safety have rarely been examined. The detection of off target effects can be confounded by genetic variation, meaning that some off target effects may go undetected. The, the CRISPR or so called CRISPR can in with invader tendly cause extensive del deletion and complex rearrangement of DNA. This misreading of DNA has the potential to produce the altered protein. Unexpected effects from on target alteration have been identified in gene edited animals and have impact animals' health. In particular, gene edited super muscly pigs are associated with abnormalities that lead to severe health problems. For that, my beloved part. Now, so genetic engineering is also called genetic modification. It's a direct manipulation of an organism's genome for biotechnology. New DNA may be inserting in the host genome for the first isolation and copying the genetics material in interest. Using molecular cloning method of the genet generate a DNA accusation of the synthesizing of a DNA. And uh, interesting that construct into a host organism. Genes may be removed or knocked out using a nuclear. Genetic engineering has re reduced a viral of drugs or hormones of medical uses. Unfortunately, there are also errors of accusation along with that. that. Uh, there has also been a lot of publicity about the wandering of a genetic engineering and cloning. The poly, dolly, etc. hydrated of scientific accesses. However, little has been said about the serious animal fell fire, fell fire problem accusations of the techniques. In reality, animal genetic, genetics or engineering is a hit or miss affair of the 500,000 to 1,000 genes of makes us a family farm animal. The purpose of only about 2% is known. Adding genes from other animals is like playing with chemistry set as all of the labels removed, except that in animals genetic engineering, the represent mentality material is a living creature which is suffering and feel pain with the experiment along the horrible way. For example, uh, although the clone slams Majin or Morgan look normal, in fact, the majority of the clone labs in the serious experiment of Morlad interact organs in the experiments reported in February yeah, in 1997, whoa, which is proceed in the clone ship, Dolly uh, 158 out of 156 impaled, whoa, impaled failed in the universe, uh, when survival, sorry, in the experiment which prob proceeds Polly, another clone ship of the 100 fetuses alive, 50, 60 days of pregnancy, only five the development of labs, which survived for more than two weeks after birth. Some lambs were still born, and one had a heart detected was killed for two weeks. So yeah, that's the problems of not confirmed of sheep in those days. But you know, genes are genes, so thank you. Thank you for telling us the genetic errors created by genetic engineering process. 
We, will, we may now advance to the question, are genetically engineered animals necessary in agriculture? Let's hear the insights of Mr. Recinto and Mr. Rubiales. Um, can you hear my voice? But Thank you. Um, genetic engineering, is it really necessary to apply this process in the field of agriculture? Mr. Rubiales, why don't we share our insight regarding about this topic? I would be happy to um, share your, share my insight, but I have start I have um, studied articles about my topic. How about you go first, Mr. Rizinto? I would be glad to. So. The fact that genetic engineering holds great potentials in different kinds of fields, including the industry, medicine, and more importantly, the agriculture, gives us a lot of insight towards this topic. The number of genetically modified animals has been increasingly for the past recent year. So why? Because it has the ability to be able to enhance the characteristics of that organism, as well as increasing the yield of animal farms and as well as crops. Hmm. It can also reduce the usage of uh, our application of protecting chemicals. Although it seems like it has a, a lot of beneficial outcome, there will always be a consequence into which correlates with the question, is it really necessary to use genetic engineering in the presence of major concerns, as well as a process that is safer to use. <clears throat> so, it has been stated in the studies that I have read that we don't know yet if eating the products of genetically modified animals could potentially harm us, and which was proven by an article by Your Genome Organization, clarifying that the scientists nor the leaders has a significant lack of agreement to this situation. That alone can affect the standing of our agriculture. Potential risks that can harm the human health can be considered a big factor on how biotechnology might damage the standing of agriculture. Additionally, focusing on biotechnology, sorry, um, additionally, focusing on biotechnology in agriculture can drastically affect the diversity among individuals. Such process might not be affordable for the poor, and hence even an average person might have a hard time trying to purchase it. So not only that, there's another reason. Um, it also hampers the nutritional value of the original organism because we add chemicals to the substance. So that chemicals or that technology that they have added towards the modifications of an animals, it creates a perfect appearance, a perfect quality, a perfect look, a perfect taste. Those are all, for instances, from the article, it's all sugar coating because the real problem here is that it lessens the nutritional value of that original organism, which is considered a bad process. So not only that, there is also another process, which is called selective breeding. Not only is it as effective as biotechnology, it is also safer. Why? Why choose a kind of process that has a potential risk that can harm the people if we have an available process that can be safer. Isn't that common sense? So the thing is, selective breeding is a continuation of, or, I mean, biotechnology or genetically modified animals is a continuation of selective breeding. So the thing is, it is good, it is excellent, but there are some flaws. We can never hide those flaws. It will always show up. So the thing is, genetic engineering might work excellently, but after all, 
it is that kind of process that manipulates the natural. This is altering something which has not been created originally by humans. So if we want to have this process succeed, first, we must correct the flaw or else we should just stick to selective breathing, which is more easier and more concise way of process in terms of agriculture. That's all. Um, what do you think about my insight, Mr. Rivera? Would you also care to share yours? Thank you, Mr. Yacinto. So I would like to share my um, my informations and my insight as well. So while genetic engineering is quickly making an impact on society and its promise is great, but there are a number of concerns about the consequences that genetic engineering has for society and the environment. So for each solution that genetic engineering can that genetic engineering claims to solve, there are certain risks. In general, opponents of um, genetic engineering assert that such technology creates a huge diminution in the standing of animals, leaving them as nothing as more than as more than a uh, test tubes with tails. But that's not the, that's not just the case. Um, the ecological impacts of um, genetically engineered farm animals gives a possible numerous of threats. There are arguments that it will cause an extinction of um, selective breeding as a result of lessening the genetic, genetic diversity of such animals. So because of this, it could, it could make a large of group of animals in danger of having new variety of um, infectious diseases. Um, some people argue that transgenic farm animals are far more likely to endure suffering that, than what it is already on factory farms. So in the case of the USDA, when they implanted a human growth hormone into a pig based on my um, study, um, the results were quite unfortunate and disappointing. The pigs and the um, bow-legged, um, cross-eyed, are arthritic and had dysfunctional immune systems, and made them subs sus subs uh, subs susceptible to pneumonia. Sorry. Another instance, their cows. Um, they are commonly injected with recumbent um, bovine growth hormone or RBGH to increase their rate of mild production because they are, um, they are much more likely to suffer from uter disease. So transgenic animals, if released to or escape to natural environments while well, environments uh, it poses an enormous threat to native animal populations and the overall um, balance of the ecosystem. Some argue that any leak of the genetically engineered organism into this wild is more or less to play ecological roulette. This is so because the, of the complexity of the bio, biochemical function about which is very little is artificial is known regarding the precise function that each, each species serves within the greater ecosystem. Artificially created species, the argument goes, are unsustainable because they are not part of the web of highly synchronized relationship that are evolved over millions of years. In a study of, in a study done at Purdue University, scientists calculated that if 60 genetically engineered salmon escaped into a native natural population of 60,000, it would take only 40 generations for the wild salmon to be completely wiped out. I mean, there is no way of predicting the exact effects of um, transgenic animals or on the environment. And because studies indicate that a natural um, genetic manipulation 
poses a devastating threat to wild environments. Opponents of genetic engineering believe that complacency must be lessened and that genetically engineered solutions are no answer are are no answer for the world's current um, agri agricultural challenges. After all, even in the cases where no unfavorable impacts on the ecological functioning of natural ecosystem occur, the basic presence of introduced genes and genetically altered organisms degrades these ecosystems by diminishing the naturalness or wildness of these ecosystems. So, I do somehow agree with Mr. Resinto's thoughts. And um, based on my studies, genetic engineers are doing some problem solving to um, genetic to transgenic animals to minimize risk and to make um, genetic engineering more effective in agriculture. So my thoughts about it is that the benefits of genetic engineered animals in agriculture are not that bad. And it's like, it can have some benefits, but some disadvantages as well. It can be good because it will help animals to be more um, efficient in producing species. And it is intended to, ma to maximize profits in animal farming. But it can be bad if they don't have a credible deeper experimentation. So the genetic engineers are on it, but they're not there yet. It's, it's like it's still on the process of figuring things out on how um, genetic engineered am animals will benefit to us and into the agriculture. So to conclude, genetic engineering animals in animals just needs a deeper exploration to be sustainable and effective in agriculture. But for now, um, transgenic animals are not that necessary in agriculture because many of the current studies are performed to show that um, what is technically possible, not necessarily what is needed. So that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you for those wonderful insights. It is greatly appreciated. We may now prog progress to the preserving the natural habitats of endangered animal species, which will be discussed by Ms. Santos and Ms. Simo. Ms. Santos, kindly open your mic, unmute your mic. Thank you. Hey, can you hear me now? I'll take that as a yes, thank you. So, hi, straight to the point. <laughs> the preservation of animals and their natural habitat has been a battle that's still being fought by many in order to keep the natural order of life and, you know, to maintain a healthy ecosystem. You must be wondering why why does this all matters? Why do we need to preserve the animals and save wild, wildlife? After all, it takes a lot of time, work, effort, resources. And let me be the first to tell you why. But first, let me list down some cons. And then after that, my friend here will list down some reasons why we should preserve wildlife. OK, so number one in the list. <laughs> On an article by Steve Harbour called Endangered Species, Should We Save Them? Uh, according to a comment made by Delamore, they state that what we decide to say really is very arbitrary. It much, it much more often done for emotional or psychological or national reasons than would ever be made with a model. They continue. Ants, for instance, are essential environmental helpers distributing seeds aerating soils and eating other insects that are often human pests. If we're going to save pandas rather than ants, we need a good reason and being cute is not a good reason. They do have a point. <laughs> well, they do have a point that some people, some people tend to pick and choose what to save. But the thing is, 
There aren't as many species of ants that are endangered com compared to pandas. And it's not like we're going to ignore other endangered species and just focus on one. That's not who we are. We not want people, people. Get it? See what I did there? Of course, there are many of us who are advocating for the preservation of other in endangered animals too. Seeing as they imply that pandas don't do much work compared to ants is false. Basically false. If though they're just cute and they're lying about, they can't even mate for, for their life, literally. They do have some use. And that is bamboo is one of the most fastest growing plants in the world. And pandas are carnivores, but they chose to be herbivores. They chose to have their diet consist of bamboo. They basically chose to be bamboo population control. And since their growth can get out of hand, since I've seen some pictures on Reddit that, you know, some bamboos just go whoop at their house, especially Japanese homes and Chinese residence homes, you know? Get me? So the number two on the list. Now this is more political, I must admit, but it, it kind of helps with my argument here. And it's really, it's a huge con since it basically relies on, on animals like that, basically. The Endangered Species Act doesn't address a lot of the core issues that has been impacting wildlife in the first place. It was designed to protect endangered species. A lot of the time, though, it had done the opposite. Ever since the Trump administration weakened the protection of animals and habitat that are considered endangered and or threatened. So I did warn you it was going to get political. And for example, they may impose penalties on landowners who harbor animals if an endangered species is discovered on their property, which is to be a good thing. But the loophole is that to get around this, land landowners simply slaughter the animals or deforest their land, which is the exact opposite of what the act is supposed to prevent from happening. So the act isn't exactly the best to rely on now, but over time, they are changing their approach to these kinds of issues after Trump's presidency. More political stance, but it's a good thing because I'm not going to state why because i think you all know why trump does these kind of things <clears throat> money to <laughs> currently most of currently now most of the six 1600 species of wildlife they have protected have recovered successfully so there is a happy ending to this and i generally do hope it continues so now we're moving on to number three number three and the last last tree the last the last one on our list of the cons there has been a lot of talk about preserving animals but lack of conversations about the management and control of them when situations get out of hand it's like the panda situation with the shooting with the with the fast sprouting bamboos Kurt, uh well for example for example listen to me here Feral hogs have always been a massive destructive invasive species and they have been, well, continuously terrorizing all across America. They have been responsible for some of the animal extinctions as well. So there has been a lot of effort to control the feral pigs population via trapping, humane killing. Well, hopefully with more consideration, we could give more information about the importance of management and control of animals which could also potentially prevent more endangerment of other species. So to sum up my points, though yes, a lot of people tend to pick and choose what to save, but that doesn't mean that just because there are others who are talking about helping an endangered species, it doesn't mean they're undermining the danger of other, undermining the endangerment of other species. And that, the ESA, Endangerment Species Act, even if it's designed to protect endangered wildlife, it's very flawed and because of Trump's administration. But after his presidency, 
Their approach to these issues regarding endangered animals on private landmarks have changed for the better. And the management control of animal population hasn't been talked about at all. In fact, seldom, rarely. And it's just as crucial as the preservation of endangered animals because without having something to balance things out, it could do more harm than good to the endangered animals and humans as well. So, but a lot of a lot of people have started being talking about it, which is a good thing. Now that you know the cons of preserving endangered animals and natural habitats, my partner here will now be able to state the pros of preserving wildlife. P -p 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 Pass the mic to Z -Z -Z. Yay. <laughs> okay, thank you for that, Ms. Santos. Uh, so I'll start now. For, uh, here. <clears throat> okay. Animal extinction is a natural process that has happened throughout history, resulting in the extinction of species. There are 1,800 different categories of endangered species classified by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Plants and animals with tiny populations or ranges make up the majority of them. This natural extinction, however, is no longer under the control of nature, but is being impacted by humans, resulting in an exceptionally high rate of species extinction. However, this does not rule out the prospect of species extinction being reversed. It is feasible to save endangered creatures if everyone makes a concerted effort. Humanity's wealth, health, and growth are all depending on these creatures. To begin with, people are causing harm to species by disrupting their habitats at an alarming rate, with experts estimating that the Earth is losing 137 plants, animals, and insects species per day due to this deforestation and other types of habitat loss. The rate of habitat destruction is growing by the day to the point that scientists are claiming that it is now, it's now a race against two before their original habitats are destroyed. This demonstrates that people have little regard for our respect for the earth, and they do not appear to care as if the species has a place to call home. Habitat has the ability to repair itself to some extent. When damage surpasses the capacity of repair, a gradual reduction in the cover against predators, the availability of food to survive, and the ability to reproduce is evident. This, in, in turn, leads to the species extinction or local extinction, but only when the species departure is limited to certain areas of its range. Furthermore, if habitat loss or damage engulfs the species' whole range, it will be pushed to extinction. This is referred to as species extinction. Extinction is unavoidable and irreversible. We must remember that extinction is a one-way process and one, once a species is gone, it cannot be restored. As a result, we must recognize that the protection of a species is impossible without the conversation, conservation of its habitat. However, and the last comment on the response, I'd want to add that an animal's habitat is as vital to it as its existence itself. You must be asking what the benefits are after hearing about the downsides of preserving endangered animals' habitats. Vendis Shukla, a former associate professor of zoology, quoted that the answer to the question, how is habitat important for animals? may be summarized in a single sentence. The habitat provides a stress-free life for the animal. That is, it provides first effective protection for pre from predators, second, an adequate food for survival, and third, abundant chance to breed its offspring. So we will discuss why we should maintain it and how it will benefit us. Um, so, first, it's to undo some of the harm that people have caused and preserve 
the ecosystem for future generations. To begin with, people rely on plant and animal species for medicinal supplies. As a result, the forest and its inhabitants provide as a rich source of medication and chemical templates from which researchers might develop novel medications. According to this, inf to this information, people must make a thoughtful effort to rescue the animals. Humanity must conserve its population and health if it is to keep its medical sector and development thriving, as well as its dreams of discovering solutions for different life-threatening ailments. Second, the development in in intense agricultural output and the shift from next farming to permanent arable cycles, especially in the last 50 years, have been the primary causes of habitat loss. Farmers have been able to expand productivity and bring marginal sections of land into arable production because to larger machinery, advanced agrochemicals, better cereal strains, and state subsidies. Pesticides and potent artificial fertilizers are washed into streams from soil systems. They deplete the countryside of the plants and animals that form the foundation of complex food webs, resulting in a reduction in the numbers of species and individuals, which has a cum cumulative effect on the food chain. Furthermore, failing to protect the species put the, puts the delicate balance and structure of the food chain in risk. According to the coaster, the environment is in grave danger since a vast number of species have gone extinct. If one animal becomes extinct, it can lead to the extinction of another animal and so on, eventually leading to all of us, including humans, dying off. As a result, if the food chain is to stay whole and balanced, humans must preserve and maintain endangered species. Uh, for example, Experts in the United States are now investigating why bees are unexpectedly dying in enormous numbers. Pollination of plants requires the presence of bees. Animals that consume those plants, consume those plants may perish, perish if they aren't pollinated. We humans consume some of those plants as well as the animals that rely on them to exist. As we destroy habitats to build more cities and factories, we may be also destroying medications that can heal diseases in people that have yet to be found. If animal habitats perish, people will perish as well. Plants and plant-like microorganisms are required to recreate oxygen. We'll be gone if we lose too many people. To survive, we require clean water will be gone if we remove too much. We, like animal, like elephants, monkeys, and others, are also like animals. When you remove animal habitats, you are also removing ourselves. That's all. Thank you. Thank you for letting us know how to preserve the natural habitats of endangered animal species. We may now continue with the food safety and environmental concerns of genetically engineered farm animals by Ms. Tolentino and Ms. Tortona. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Erin Tolentino and I have found in a research titled Genetically Engineered Animals from Lab to Factory Farm by Friends of the Earth that there is a section in that paper talking about food safety and environmental concerns of genetically engineered farm animals. There are considerable concerns regarding the environmental and food safety of genetically engineered farm animals intended for human consumption, as well as concerns about animal welfare. The concerns fall into two categories, those related to the novel trait and those related to the genetic engineering process. The novel trait conferred by the genetic engineering process could have impacts on food and environmental safety. For example, the increased antibacterial properties in milk from cows that have been genetically engineered to reduce susceptibility to mastitis might affect or impair human gut bacteria. Hence, the effect of the novel trade needs to be carefully 
considered. However, the overarching concern related to food and environmental safety of all genetically engineered organisms of both plants and animals and including gene-edited organisms is that they can exhibit unexpected and unpredictable effects as a result of the genetic engineering process. Any unexpected or unpredictable effects could result in unintended alterations to physiological processes in the engineered animal, potentially altering the composition and the chemistry of the edible parts of animals or how it interacts with the environment. The US FDA recognizes that, uh, that one of the primary concerns regarding food safety of GMOs is that any novel or altered proteins created by genetic engineering process, whether intentional, intentionally or inadvertently created, might give rise to, the, to allergies when, eating, when eaten by people. In addition, the FDA is also concerned with whether ge the genetic change has altered any physiological processes in the genetically engineered animal that might result in an increased food consumption risk. The concerns over food safety of genetically engineered animals mean that they need to be scrutinized extremely carefully before being mar marketed to consumers. The environmental risks associated with genetically engineered farm animals are not well defined because there are as yet no commercially available genetically engineered farm animals and very few studies on what the potential risk might be have been performed. However, risks include escape into the wider environment, the use of antibiotic marker resistant genes, and the further intensif intensification of animal ag agriculture. I think that on paper, this seems like a good idea, using science to provide more food for the people. It is a good idea in the sense where we have, a, where we have an alternative and we do not have to kill millions of animals. Where I am concerned is with, is will it contain the same nutritional values as real animals have and are there any drastic changes that will possibly affect the people that will consume this? And as for the environmental issues involving this, there are still unknown environmental impacts. And this may possibly be bad for the environment and contribute to the issues we have now. And this will be executed properly, where it is safe for people to consume as well as environmentally friendly, then there is a possible and there is a possibility of this being normal for consumers. Though there have not been many studies made about food or environmental safety of genetically engineered animals, I think that this area still needs more research. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hi, my name is Kay, and my topic on this symposium is about food safety and environmental concerns of genetically engineered farm animals. To preface, I may have a slight bias leaning towards this subject matter, regardless of the ethical quadrants that it may contain. I'll first discuss the meaning of genetic engineering, followed by a few examples, and finally, its pros and cons. Now, to begin, let's clarify as to what genetically engineered means. Uh, Genome.gov first described it as a term that was first introduced into our language in the 1970s to describe the emerging field of recombinant DNA technology and some of the things that uh, were going on. Now, as technology developed and it has now become more of an entire field of recombinant DNA technology, genomics, and in genetics in the 2000s, in essence, it's the artificial uh, change to a creature's genome to give it more desirable traits or enhance its already existing traits. Contrary to popular belief, genetic engineering isn't always done by people in white coats in a black uh, sight lab. In fact, it happens more often than we think, in places we would never expect. A good example of genetically engineered or transgenic animal is a beast of burden, a mule. Born from a male donkey and a female horse, uh, they're larger than donkeys, which allows them to carry more, but aren't as uh, fragile as horses, who are, for lack of a better word, a bit lacking in the endurance department. Not to mention, horses are expensive to both obtain and maintain. So the people of yesteryear, wanting a cheaper and more reliable solution to their transportation problem, decided to play God or, in their time, Zeus, bred a donkey with a horse, and created the mule. 
uh, they were even created even before Moses was even born, with some of their very first reports being in the Iliad by Homer in 800 BC, more specifically in Book 24. This shows that genetic engineering isn't new to us. Funnily enough, we've been doing it longer than we've acknowledged its existence. With that, uh, with that short history out of the way, let's discuss the pros and cons. I'll speak of the negatives first. First, there seems to be the sphere of genetically modified organisms, whether that be agriculture or livestock. Many people believe that just because something is unnatural, that it's automat automatically harmful to you. That a product specifically created to provide the maximum amount of nutrition will somehow be less filling than random pest-infested buckwheat. To make matters even more confusing, and to return to my original point, we have been modifying plants and, to a lesser extent, livestock for a very, very, very long time. When compared to each other, a wild piece of corn looks more akin to a, tea po uh, to a pea pod than it does to the corn we have nowadays. The fear of genetically modified food seems to be unfounded, uh, an unfounded one, as we've already been eating it for most of our lives, well, our whole lives, and our food appears to want to cooperate with us, accepting the changes we make since that allows them to propagate and be grown more, outliving their wild counterparts. Honestly, when it comes to negatives about genetically modified organisms, it's difficult to find a negative point that isn't from somebody grossly misinformed about the situation. Like I've said before, humans have been selectively breeding since we knew it was a thing. It's just this time we know the people behind it and they're no longer expert breathens, uh, breeders from the Athens. So I could say that there's the whole idea of this topic where this topic falls apart, because there is no food and safety environmental concerns about genetically modified crops and livestock. It's a boogeyman and most likely a sign of people continuing to accept science. With that out of the way, let's talk about the positives. Starting out, transgenic crops and livestock can provide more nutrients with similar or less resources than standard crops and livestock. We have bred cows that give more milk and meat and rice that can provide nearly as much nutrients as a full meal. Going beyond just simple necessities, we began researching on the removal of birth defects and terminal illnesses. Now, there's always that looming threat of eugenics, but that's more of a societal problem than it is a transgenic problem. There's so much potential for this kind of science, yet the biggest tragedy is that it goes criminally underfunded. Another positive is that we've developed crops that are more resistant to both pests and pesticides, so crop plague is a thing of the past. This research could also be applied to livestock such as cows who have a chance of succumbing to mad cow disease or chickens who have the avian flu. So to finish off, aside from the moral quantities, let's cause you know, let's be honest here, we already lack when it comes to this topics, when when it comes to this type of topic. The only thing we need to fear when it comes to genetic engineering is if the corporations who fund it decide to monetize and privatize it to their own benefit, leaving the average farmer with nothing. Thank you, that's all. Thank you so much for discussing the food safety and environmental concerns of genetically engineered farm animals. So all of those subtopics that were discussed are the cons of genetic engineering. And now let us have the closing remarks, which will be presented by Mr. Antonio. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, excellencies, distinguished delegates, Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to have taken part in this symposium. I thank the wonderful program directors for this event and for the excellent collaboration. I wish to thank the students of DG Arts 111 for their support and great hospitality. As we are getting to the end of this symposium, let me share with you the following brief points. During the program, we have seen so many wonderful topics and research that we were that were presented to us beautifully by the wonderful and amazing students. During this symposium, we had the opportunity to discuss challenges and share information on how to protect endangered and animal species and pros and cons of the genetic engineering. More, more than ever, there is a need for coll collaboration across levels of governance and across sectors to solve the many present and future challenges that the endangered plant and animal species and the pros and cons of the genetic engineering might encounter. Only by working together can we help protect these fragile species and to value each organism. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that this symposium has provided you with new insights and tools. If even one idea shared during these past few hours can be translated into a new strategy or policy, then we can say that this symposium has achieved it, 
its objectives. Finally, I thank all of you for your participation. I hope you have enjoyed your presence at this symposium. I wish you all a beautiful day. Thank you.